to DevOps United Kingdom. Thanks for coming. My name is Peter Pilgrim, and I'm going to talk to you about testing, uh, test driven development, Java EE7, and Archelian and embedded containers. I'm so proud to, that this conference is actually happening in, in a town that I was born in, a city that I was born in. And so it's great to actually present at the first DevOps UK, and I hope there'll be many more opportunities. So I'm Peter Pilgrim. I'm a Java champion. I like Scala, I like JavaFX, and I like Java EE7. So I used to run a user group, user group called a Java Web User Group. I don't know if any members are here. Some are probably are around. And um, yeah, I ran it for six years. I've got a background in financial services since. I've been programming in Java since 1998 and maybe tried to program in Java by spending 99 pounds in Semantic J, not realizing that Java was free. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So. I'm also the author of an up-and-coming book called the Java EE7 uh, Developer User Guide. I don't know what the full title is going to be yet, so I'm halfway through writing this book, and I hope to get it delivered for Java 1. And so, if you could raise your hands, if you are, consider yourself an agile developer, please raise your hands. Oh, for the benefit of the tape, that was, keep your hands raised. I would say that's more than 75% of the audience. If you do test-driven developer in whatever cognitive definition you think in your head, keep your hands raised. Okay, about 75% or more. Now I would say, can anyone, if you recognize what this graphic symbol is here, keep your hands raised. Raise your hands. So that's actually, one, two, that's about less than 25%. Actually, can you tell me, sir, what this, that icon is? Yes. Yeah. So that is Scrum Poker. That is this. Uh, it's really these stats were just to show how agile we are. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to uh, at a pace. Why do we test? Well, we want to test to measure the value and validate our software. So we are measuring for performance and efficiency. We're measuring if the software actually does what it's supposed to be doing. Um, if it is, then it works. Uh, we'd, we are measuring for stability, and we, if we have to do refactoring, we want to be able to maintain our software. I, I've been a contractor. I once upon a time had to redevelop a workflow engine, and that was my first job. And guess what? Nobody had written any tests for this <laughs> workflow engine, a finite state machine. So before I could change the code, I had to write tests for the production code. Okay. So our tools of the trade are JUnit, TestNG. And so you may already know these tools. Some you do, do not. Uh, like perhaps anybody use any alternative JVM languages out there like Groovy or Scala? They probably know Spock and Scala tests. And of course, we've got our beloved IDE, our Integrated Development in, uh, Environment. Of course, we also have Selenium, web developers. And those of you like me, yet again, who have to work with um, content professionals or web strategists, you have to deal with um, uh, Selenium a lot. At least the testers do. I don't. I just write the code, man. <laughs> And so why are we into test-driven development? Well, so essentially what we have is, and this is where I do my magic trick, I'm only joking, of course. Um, we only have, we are only supposed in TDD to wear either one hat or the other. We either wear in our refactoring hat 
and we're writing test code or we are writing our production code. And no wonder t TDD is sort of confusing for many people in, uh, of my age because um, TDD is very schizophrenic. What hat am I wearing? What, what is this? So what we are trying to do in a test, for those who don't know what it is, we write our unit test first and then we write production code to actually pass the test. Then after that, if we get a green bar, we then start refactoring our unit tests, getting, perhaps we are checking away lots of unit tests. And then after that, we get a green bar again, then we write some production code again. And, and we have some JBoss people here who, um, and they have an expression which I love, which is called rinse and repeat. And I love that phrase, that's great. So that's what T, the test-driven cycle is about. And the essentials of testing are essentially what we're doing when we're writing a test, any test, uh, and talking about formal testing now, not just visual testing, we are doing the three A's. The first A is to assign, the second is to act, and the third is to assert. So when we assign, we are creating our objects, we're creating a dependency graph of our objects, we're bringing our objects into life, a la spring. <laughs> and then we then test the behavior, we invoke some behavior, we act, we do whatever it is, we dance. And then after that, we do um, a test. Does our actual results actually meet the expected results and we should know that. So going back to my contracting day of refactoring the workflow, I had to know, I had to come up with these expected results. Is this state approval, then rejection, then someone else approval, then someone re rejects again, is that right or not? Of course, there is a caveat enter. There's always a caveat enter there. Um, the biggest thing with testing is that it's the assignment. It's a huge bubble. It's been when we are testing or writing tests, and again, it's another anecdote. I went to a, a certain house, and they were pre-spring. They had brilliant ideas, even before the spring and dependency injection frameworks. And what it was difficult to test their core code or fight, dig well enough deep into their infrastructure and that's because they had massive test fixtures and that so um, I suppose levels of developers had written and then it was like oh my god I don't understand this test fixture here so of course what happens then we created mock objects or stubs to actually run especially J2EE tests and normally we do that outside of the container because it has been in the past really hard to write these tests. So I'm going to divert and talk to you about Java EE7 because this is a bit of a learning for you. So Java EE7 is going to be releasing um, Q2. We're almost in Q2 of 2013 so I guess that would be the summer uh, maybe July, maybe August of 2013, uh, providing they get all the specs. So in Java EE7, now we will have contents and dependency injection 1.1, EJB 3.2, um, WebSockets for the first time. If you were at Alan's talk today, you would have seen that. You, there's updates to JAXRS so, um, and various other things like Batch. Catch didn't make it, unfortunately. Yeah. And of course, you've got JSF and, and JSON. So, testing with mocks is the old way. It is time now to change our testing. And one of the first, well, the first, first framework that I noticed since writing the book was a framework called Archelian, which is open source integration test, testing, and uh, started by Peter Muir, uh, David Blevin, and I think Aslik is in the audience here. He is the maintainer of Achillean, and it's a, a fabulous, great f framework. 
So what does uh, Achillean give us? It gives us the ability to run um, our unit tests and inside the container. So it's designed to be portable. It's based um, essentially on the old idea that I don't know if anybody would remember Apache Cactus. And it was a very cumbersome method, which is now uh, uh, an open source project, which is now part circa 2005, 2004, maybe there was some development work active on it. And the idea was to uh, write the unit test and uh, using some annotations, you can deploy on the container. And, and then the framework is quite extensible. So there's uh, uh, adapters for glassfish, there's adapters for weld, um, both standalone and enterprise edition. And the, one of the, the secret source is this idea of a, a product called shrink wrap, which is you can think of it as a virtual uh, Java archive builder and creator. So it allows you to write in builder syntax a, a jar, and then you can put certain artifacts and classes in it. So you can create a, a web resource jar, an ordinary Java archive jar. Um, you can even do something sophisticated like create a resource archive as well. Right, okay. Hello. Help me something there. Okay. Uh oh. Sorry about this. My machine has seemed to have stopped. <laughs> okay. Okay. Menu control <laughs> this time. Okay. I was talking about context and dependency injection 1.1. So, content. Dependency injection. How many people know context and dependency injection? A few people here. We have many, I suppose, a good portion. So it's a way of injecting beans into another bean. It's strongly typed. And the, dev the benefits is that all your beans have contextual uh, conversation scope. And, and you can have qualifiers, providers, and also lifecycle events. And so if I can grab my machine back, um, I'm going to show you the Gradle. I, I use Gradle. How many people here heard of Gradle? Gradle the build tool? So Gradle is the, it's a much better Maven for, for us. I, at work, I use Maven because that's what the company does. But privately, privately, and if you're lucky enough to do Android development, you can now use Gradle. So lots of people are migrating to it. I think the Spring Source guys are doing that as well. So, um, so these, this, don't be put off by all these uh, dependencies. But of course, Gradle is written in Groovy. So it looks like it is a DSL, domain-specific language. And all these dependencies, and I've released the source code, get you the, uh, the Archelian uh, dependencies. And of course, I'm using Java EE7, at least beta or batch. So that is build number 81. And of course, we've got the beloved JUnit there. So Archelian, what you need to do is uh, you write your tests and you use a run with annotation with the Archelian class. Um, and then you can have a, a unit test name. And this uh, annotation at deployment uh, defines um, how, which, how, de defines the archive you want to deploy in the uh, embedded container. So you have this, uh, we have the shrink wrap, which is a static um, and, and a create method, which is a static method. And you can see it's generally like a declarative builder syntax where you can add classes. So that's um, a basic user, user detail repository. And it's the va variable arguments 
uh, method that we call here. Then we add our ma manifest resource, which is uh, declaring that we are, it's an empty asset and we pour, uh, context, and in order to initialize a context dependency inje injection container, you always have this empty beans.xml and it doesn't actually have to exist, but you have to declare it. So the next part is our unit test. And surprise, surprise, in, uh, we can inject a CDI bean, which is our user detail repository. And in, then we have the test, which is everybody should understand what JUnit test methods look like. We create a user, we do some uh, uh, assert, and then do the action and do another assert. So we test that the user does not exist in the repository already. Then we do the act bit, and then we do the assert. Simple. OK. So I will switch to a demo now. And uh, let's get IntelliJ, get the right version, the window. OK, not traditional. So basic user detailed test is the thing I was running, looking at. So if I just run this, you'll be able to see exactly what it does. So it, um, it starts an embedded glass fish and deploys this archive, which only contains the user detail interface and the basic detail repository. Uh, the actual implementation of the class is, is not really important, but the fact is that we have a passing test. And actually, we get in, get in, we're changing our mindset. Why on earth do we need mock objects when we can actually test inside the container? OK, so I have, um, for those of you, let's see my, our time. OK, I think I have some time to just delve into the implementation a bit. So the implementation of basic user detail is fairly straightforward. Um, concurrent string or maps to a user records objects. And there you can create a user, put things into hash map. And you've got a really numb, brain dead authentication method. So uh, nothing too fussed about that. And the, the important thing is that your CDI bean is application scope. So as soon as you deploy this uh, war to the um, server, it's uh, actually like servlet context scope, Ed, for those of you who know servlets really well. It, uh, for, you have that for the lifetime as your war file is, deplo is deployed to the container. And there it is. And there, that's the game, as they say. There are some more things you can do with CDI. Um, you can have a, um, an interface, and you can have qualifiers, things that are known as qualifiers. And what qualifiers are, do are actually annotations. So that means I, if I go back to my unit tests and find the, uh, uh, yeah, let's run that one. Um, I can have a qualifier. Now, this is an economy credit processor unit test, and my qualifier is at economy. So you kind of get what, what, it, what this is about. Whatever credit agency I can get, I can have a premium one or the economy version. And, and it's the same kind of code. So essentially, I can run that, and that should pass. And in this one, I don't know if you actually saw the output. I actually could dump out the contents, contents of what's in our shrink wrap. You can see the actual classes that are there. And this is why I guess it's, uh, it's 
this is the attraction for me. I said, wow, what is this shrink wrap way of doing things? I've been mucking about with mock objects and stub objects for so long. I wish I could use that in my current projects because it really makes sense because you're not, I mean, in spring, there is um, a, a surf-lit mock uh, framework which is based on 2.5, which is an old version of the surf-lit specification. And now we are going to have surf-lit 3.1. So how you can't really use that anymore in more modern applications. Okay, so that's enough for CDI and, and testing for in Archelian. Uh, if I go back to the slides. Uh, so the next bit is, wow, well, EJBs. So everybody knows what EJB is. So you know it's a service bean endpoint which can be co-located or remote it has transactional support, which is why people tend to use EJBs. There's lifecycle management. And, and now, in, since Java EE 5 and 6, you can have um, web services and, and WESTful services, and also web sockets, also as EJBs. As, and, and the reason why we call them as endpoints, because that's perhaps uh, when I'm looking at the stateless version. So if I switch back to... Uh, uh, presentation again and get that here. And I do have an example there of code. And so this is the EGB support desk. And essentially, it's the same thing here. So the support desk looks like that. So it's if you've had any problems ever with call centers trying to get an agent, <laughs> this is uh, exactly what he does. Uh, so it should retrieve different agents. The only thing that I'm delivering in this shrink wrap is a support desk bean. So, and again, let's observe. The test should run. Yeah, there you go. So you got some weird names for agents, but it, it validates that the test should run. And of course, what I'm doing is, is putting all the ne agent names in a set, in a bucket, really. And if the agent size is not equal to the value that, that I've retrieved, then it, the test has failed. Okay, so pretty basic examples. Now something for Meteor. Um, WebSockets. WebSockets are... Oh, I jumped too, too fast. Rex sockets are from what Aaron said this morning, peer-to-peer -peer con um, socket connections. Um, they have a reduced payload. So what that means, as Aaron said, there's only two bytes. And it means that you don't have this uh, in comparison with normal HTTP communications, all these user agents, all this header information. So therefore, um, it's got to be faster. It's got to be more efficient. The fact is also that it, uh, you, the communications are multiplex. So you can have many clients using the same socket. And it's the actual implementation underneath that is, I suppose, fanning in these connections into one pipe and then fanning them out into the respective um, end point sockets and we tend tend to be talking about in the Java EE specifications lots now is full of ideas of endpoints because essentially what you're doing is, is communicating over a network to some remote thing and therefore it is an endpoint with when you think about web sockets well it's not just the server that's an endpoint it's actually the client that's an endpoint so you have by being peer-to-peer any side could close, any side could send each other a message, and so you've got chat roulette on the Java, proper implementation of chat roulette, if they ever get the video drivers and an API sorted in Java. Okay, so let's jump straight into another demo of, of this. And... Uh, so the actual test is called Echo Server Endpoint Test. And this time I am creating 
a web archive, which is different from a Java archive. Well, it makes sense because these things are web sockets. And on what I need to deliver in this payload is something called the uh, WebSocket server. So let's double click that so you get uh, a view on this. So again, this is the annotation ba base uh, WebSocket. And so the actual package has been split into uh, a sub package called server which is different from what Aaron showed in his slides this morning. They've recently done this in the last three weeks or so. So you get server endpoint, and your value is the URI template, which is anything that's on the slash echo after the context, your web context, will, will declare, will be hitting this echo server endpoint. And the way to write a, an echo server is just this method here, which just takes um, a string, and then returns the string. So it gets more complicated than that if you want to d use the non-annotated version. And of course, with, if for, do for those of you who have happened to have looked at the Java script WebSocket implementations, there you get a similar mirroring, which I quite I like, where, you, where you've got at and open, when you know that the summons appears open a web con connection to you, and I'm saying you as you being an endpoint, and you want to know when something has been closed and when, when there's a, an error, maybe the connection has died. So it's quite useful then um, to, to have um, this. There's a, a secret source which I will uh, include here, which is allowed. And this is the session. So, if you know what your session is, what your endpoint is, therefore you know also who's connected to you, therefore you can have a list of all these sessions and the, and the peers that are connected. And voila, you have chat server by recording these peers. So that's it. So. I've already written that, so that's that. So let me undo that. I don't want to break the demo. And so the next tricky bit is I have my in my shrink wrap, which is a web archive. I'm adding my classes. You can also add packages. So you don't have to do this. This is just for illustration. So you can supply uh, Beans XML, but you can also supply persistence context, like a, a database um, in like Java DB or uh, um, what is it, H2. So you can have a, a, a different sort of database there that will allow you to run your application, um, perhaps locally. And therefore, so in this, uh, in should invoke echo server point test method, uh, I'm creating the actual URI, resource, uh, uniform resource indicator, to actually connect to the server, the endpoint. And to have to do a, a few things here, which are quite horrible, and which is to do with concurrency. But I think I just run the test, actually, and then I, I explain a bit more what's going on. So, whoop. Get out of that. Uh, just run the test. So again, the glass fish starts up. And now I shall have to move this window up. Oh, there we go. So the forget the illegal state exception. What's happening here that you can see the archive, this bit here, success web archive, was given a, a random web context name and it was successfully deployed. And therefore, we have this um, strange URI here. And the WS stands for WebSocket Protocol. So it makes a connection and the container, you get a, the implementation, the client manager. Uh, eventually, you will see that the 
server endpoint was opened and it received a, me a message, which is the anonymous class, and then it's sending that, that back to uh, the client. So let me move that. And of, of course, that passes the test, which is what we expected to receive down here. Uh, so why the difficulty in implementing that sort of thing? Well, because Java e E7 is not finalized, the standard is moving, the annotations keep changing names, and, pe and there are bugs to be fixed in the implementations. Uh, the first thing you have to do is to uh, uh, use a countdown latch or some way of knowing when you've done two things. I, I have successfully sent that message to that remote endpoint, which is one stroke. The other second stroke is, did I actually receive a message back, which is the other stroke? And once you've done that, uh, you can implement a method like get receive with message, which is basically waits. Um, on a certain time for the, the concurrent latch to complete. Um, there's a lot of code there, um, and you probably can do it through annotations, but it works. Um, I'll post it, all of this in, in a blog and get it on GitHub, and you can survey it to your heart's content. Uh, is there anything more I want to speak about this? Yes, uh, the, yes the, there are two types of API in the web sockets. You can have a synchronous mode or you can have asynchronous mode. So there's a, a remote endpoint ASIC remote, which obviously means that it's non-blocking, which is why we, use, we are supposed to use web sockets. It's based on non-blocking input and output IO, a synchronous IO, which it means that you, in, you can build scalable web services. Okay, I think we've seen that. Uh, we've seen that. Uh, let's go back. Um, I did have, uh, let me go back. I think I do have 18 minutes here. I'll go back to slides because I had planned to show you the, the Westful side of Archelian, because Archelian can do that. But unfortunately, there's a bug in Glassfish. <laughs> and, and what happens is that it doesn't work. <laughs> so, but we can discuss it. So RESTful service kind of looks like that, where we have a path, and I've called it um, Great Books, and I have a list of famous authors and their books. And it's a simple get protocol just to return the list of books followed by a new line. And that's all it does. And I have my book, which is a simple, po uh, a mutable POJO, actually, since I've made the, the actual parameters, the properties final. And yeah, well, near enough anyway. So in Java, in the Westful, uh, Jack's RS 2.0, we now have something which used to be called client factory. So it was very hard to, um, in a standard way, to invoke um, the JAX OS uh, as a, in client mode. But the way you're supposed to do it now is to have a client builder, which kind of mirrors what's in web sockets now. So you have client provider. And it's, again, you would retrieve a builder from a static method, and then you can build, like, your protocol, what you connect to, uh, the port and the host name and things like that. You can add security and stuff. So what you get back is uh, something called a web target here. And then, then you can in get the request and retrieve the get response. You can also do the post response as well, where you have to fill in a form programmatically. So after that, you should get a OK response, which is a 200, and you should actually get the response back. But uh, just to throw out of fun, um, what should happen, it should invoke the web service. But unfortunately, it doesn't because of a glassfish bug at the moment. So I get something completely weird, wherever it is. Something about error initialized key manager factory, unrecoverable key, which is a deep, 
uh, glass fish for a bug, but it's neither here or there. Eventually, it will get fixed, which is a shame. It would have been a, quite a useful demo. But hopefully, in a couple of weeks, that will be fixed and in the next version of Glassfish. Oh, be, am I? Oh, that probably does matter. This is where pair programming does help. <laughs> yeah, I don't need to replace. Okay, that should work actually. Let's see if it works. No, nope. it doesn't. I don't know why. Ah, I don't know. This one of those things we'll have to come back to. Strange, but a good spot. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I Aaron, I saw in a in a Jira that Aaron had reported this bug about two weeks ago. So weeks ago. So I don't know why. Okay, so embeddable containers. So embeddable containers are containers, containers like Glassfish. And there was a fellow here called James w Ward. He used to work for Heroku, and now works for TypeSafe. And I think he coined the term of containerless web applications. So James, when he's working at Heroku, where, where it's a cloud provider service, where you can choose what your application server could be, like it could be Tomcat or Jetty. And his idea was to, like what many developers were doing, were writing and embedded these containers like Jetty in jar files so that you can have a, a RESTful service like just without. And the reason why they did this, because system management hell. There were firewalls. They just wanted to deploy some web service somewhere and call it from another application to which they control. So the idea of containerless web application. The reason why I bring this up is because it's the secret source that, I, that also helps with Archillion to, and you may want to dig d deeper and do this yourself. So I'm going to show you how to do, how Glassfish embedded container works. And of course this is actually yeah, you can try with Jetty, of course, or Tommy, or any of these other application servers and, and web profile containers. Okay, so what we have for Glassfish, I wonder if my thing is actually working anymore. So Glassfish um, has something called something, an object called glassfish. Well, anyway. And so this is the method of creating this, um, my glassfish embedded instance. So there's a few package names that I'm missing here, obviously, dot org, dot glassfish, dot blah -de blah dot, dot embedded. So glassfish allows you to have bootstrap properties, which you can use to control how it starts up. You get a runtime and you bootstrap your with bootstrap properties, then you can have specific properties for and configure Glassfish. So one of the most important pieces is the port. So you want, might want to change that from 8080 to 9999, for example. And you can also do this with the SSL port. So, and then once you've done that, you just call new Glassfish and that will instantiate an embedded version of Glassfish, which is really quite straightforward and quite simple and quite elegant. Okay, my pinger is working again. Um, to start and stop Glassfish, once you have the runtime instance, then you, um, the Glassfish instance, then you can just simply start it. And if you want to stop it, you just call stop. And of course, it throws the exceptions if things are going, going wrong. The next bit of the source is to actually deploy a war file. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky when you have to then bind somehow in your application as a hard-coded name or some derived name 
that is your war farm. Otherwise, if, if, it's no point starting and stopping glassfish or an embedded container if you don't deploy a war to it, because it's actually going to be empty of and at least glass fishes. I don't know for Jetty if you can start it up and have the, the war file already in place. Maybe you can. And so this method will just get the deployer instance and it expects any files, any arguments to it to be war files or things to be deployed. And that basically is that. So I will show you this. I need to switch projects. Oh, okay. So I here it is the abstract embedded runner thing that in more finer detail. And the imports you actually need are uh, yes, in bloody blah, blah glassfish embeddable. And there's a few more uh, methods. There's also an, uh, an undeploy method. So if you want to undeploy applications, you can do. So here I'm getting the deployer, and I'm undeploying the whole, any war files that have been deployed in the GlassFish server. And this method here, deploy with rename, is like uh, it's forcing a new context name. So expecting the war file. And, and then saying that is the new context, and yeah, I'm just overriding the settings. So how is this used? Well, uh, since I've written this abstract embedded runner, uh, it's an abstract class, all I need is the embedded runner, which of course, which this uh, class is. So in my main, I invoke new embedded runner on port 8080, I'm using um, builder syntax here, which is why the method was, was returning its instance of itself to init and then start. And now, by this time, uh, after the this line number 19, glass should be should be glass fish embedded should be running. And then I deploy my artifact. And because I am using Gradle, um, it lives in a specific folder which is obviously non-portable, but it's not designed to be port portable. The whole point of this is to get around sysadmin, <laughs> system administration, so that you can run an instance somewhere without somebody smacking your hand saying, that's wrong, that's forbidden. Okay, so once you run that, all you do is sleep and wait until someone presses uh, enter. And then after that, you can stop the runner. Okay, so so if I run this, and I have, okay, it's the WebSockets ex echo example. So I should see my server has run it, ran, it is running now, and I just dumped out a load of the class path here just for research and understanding. So if I have my Chrome browser, I have a predefined. So this is the JavaScript. So take a note of this URL. If you are writing WebSocket implementations in Java or, or in other, any other language, this is a handy uh, thing to connect to a WebSocket anyway. So if you use uh, the default URL, then it will connect. So this is going to echo.websocket.org, that web service, and, so I'd, and disconnect. So let's see. If I go to localhost, and I think I called my context web, my web app slash echo, and connect, I am connected. So if I t now type in uh, DevOps UK 2013 and send that message, voila, so that is executing 
the WebSocket in Glassfish in an embedded container. And I think it proves the point that you, you can do this yourself with the reference implementation right now. And other implementations of the Java EE, Java EE7 specification will, will probably follow suit. See, Java EE7 specification will, will probably follow suit. Okay. Okay. Were there any questions to that, by the way? Okay. And so I guess on closing, uh, let's get through this then. Um, there's this old notion of heavyweight versus lightweight servers that was around five, ten years ago. Really, I think that's mute because everything is managed, everything is contained these days. The only thing that is limiting you is disk space and you can get tons of it and the amount of RAM. And, and if you think about where Java EE 7 is supposed to go into the cloud, then that's the cloud is perhaps the heaviest container there is. So Amazon and Heroku and things like that, the, past, the platform as a solution, platform as a service solutions, yeah. I, I think this is an old term anyway. And then, anyway, if you know how to weigh these containers, please let me know. So the developer summary is what you guys will do now. So of course you can change, it's up to you. If you want to change, if you want to go with the same mocking solutions, you can. Mockito is great, easy mock is great. I love those things and I work with those things, at least Mockito, on a daily basis, because it's still here. But until that day comes when we can run Achillean professionally and do our work, I uh, look forward to that. And it, I think Achillean is the first example of these new kind of integration, open source integration, um, test containers. So it's a, a different test f philosophy. The, the hardest part about testing is always that fl uh, flaming assign bit because it's a huge beam off. It's always wha what put off developers from testing. So, and also embedded containers. So these are the resources. So I flashed them up very quickly. And you'll get the slides if you look at my blog. I'm going to, and the p pretty pictures, I'm going to credit and uh, attribute the authors. I've asked the authors for each of their photographs, and it's uh, Creative Commons. And, well, game over. That's the end. I've got a couple of minutes for questions, if there are any, on Java EE7, what I'm writing, blogging. You, sir, shout. Well, the qualifier is actually, well, the question was, wants to know more about what is the qualifier. The qualifier is a, it's a way of uh, fine-tuning what your dependencies are, really. That's what I would say. It's a, actually, the qualifier is an annotation. If you didn't see that before, it's basically an annotation that you write, you the guy write, it's a runtime annotation. Any more questions? Did that answer your question? Okay. Any more questions? At? Uh, no, you don't. You, well, you can, you don't have to add. You only had to add enough classes in a shrink wrap. I'm, I'm, so I think the question was, do I have to add all my objects to make shrink wrap work? Well, you can start with the smallest one in your dependency. So, but if you have a, a big class, suppose you are not, you, you've got some fat which pulls in things everywhere, then you probably have no choice but to pull in those dependencies. And, yeah, so unfortunately, you pull in em enough dependencies to get your test to run, which is, I guess, more important in, in the test-driven well. And then you can say, ah, oh, my tests actually run. Now I put my other hat on. <laughs> well, 
we factor. Any more? In my experience, um, it potentially could if you have lots of D's like anything else. You, if you probably will have to take it with a pinch of salt. I would suggest then the biggest dependency is the actual container. Obviously, you saw a glass fish, which is the full container. Hopefully, in the future, the, you'll get a much more cut-down container. Because there are things that you really don't need. You don't need batch or, or catch or J-batch. So you may get away with, um, with something like Tommy when it becomes ready, and, or things like Tomcat. Is that any more questions? I think time's up. Thank you very much for attending. And enjoy DevOps UK!